Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. As we wait for everyone to join, um, we'd love to know where you're joining in from. So feel free to put in the chat who you are, where you're joining from. Michael from Victoria, thanks for joining us. Portland, Oregon, Indiana, Florida, North Carolina. Nice. Arkansas, more Florida, Illinois. Great, we have a we have a good crowd. San Diego, me too. I'm here in San Diego as well. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. We'll go ahead and get started. So welcome. Um, in our first ever open to the public quad event, we'll have our SEO expert, Julian Grace, walk us through some SEO best practices for nonprofits. And we'll get to that in a moment. First, let's discuss how you can engage in today's event. If you have questions, use the Q&A feature at the bottom. Don't forget to check your inbox after the event. We'll be emailing you the replay, slides, and resource links within a couple days. And if you learned something cool, feel free to tweet at us at TechSoup with hashtag TechSoupQuad. And also just a reminder that closed captioning is available. You just turn that on with the CC button located in your Zoom menu. Now, before we get into today's content, I want to welcome you to the TechSoup Global Network, especially for those of you who are new here. At TechSoup, we believe technology like smartphones, internet connectivity, training, and more have the power to serve our communities better. And today's speaker will give you a good taste for what this looks like in action. Now, before we jump into the presentation, I want to point out again that this is our first ever open to the public quad event. Normally, these events are closed to only Quad members. And so for those of you who are unfamiliar with Quad, we have TechSoup's Aaron Dowell to give a brief intro of our newest initiative. Hi, Aaron. Hey, Stephen. Thanks a lot. Hi, everybody. So um, yeah, Quad is our new subscription, homegrown subscription offer. Um, most of you know us for um, our product catalog and a lot of resources we have on our site. Uh, but you may, with the product catalog, you may do like a one-off transaction. You come, you need QuickBooks, you log in, you get in, you leave. Uh, but you may want more support uh, from that. And uh, to try and rectify that, we wanted to create a subscription model, a feature, like a year-long subscription with a set of features that provide wraparound support for the products you get. So we worked with 62 different org organizations for about a year and a half, trying to understand and get feedback from them about what a subscription model would look like that would be successful and what features that they would want. And they told us, of course, they want products, uh, they want courses, but also they want a space where they can talk to each other, to kind of share ideas and solutions around their common issues um, and kind of harness their historical experience with each other. So we created Quad and here's what you get. Uh, you get a community space that we built out with a members only curated knowledge base uh, you get products uh, without admin fees and courses, and you also get support. Okay, next slide. So I'll break it down a little further. Quad is $200 for the year. Uh, we base that off of the average annual spend of our members. So we're really, again, conscientious around cost. Um, I will start with the, the middle column. Um, so with Quad, you uh, we remove the admin fees on all products, courses, and services. So this is great, of course, if you have like a tech plan for the year, uh, this uh, this value will go way beyond $200. Uh, if you have product needs, if you have course needs, we have a great uh, list of courses to help with the skill set of your staff. Um, and then to the right is individualized support. That's me. I'm the one that could help you out over the course of the year. That's part of the... Um, extra features and support you get, a wraparound support you get with the products. Um, if you have any questions, you can come to me, you can email me, we can talk about it, I can find some uh, assistance and support for you. 
And then lastly, to the left, I wanted to showcase the column here. This is the big deal for us. Uh, I think this is the best part about the quad membership for a lot of people, which is the, this community space that we've built out. Uh, again, the space includes members only content. Uh, we Every day our content team or every week is uh, filling it with really deep knowledge, useful posts. Um, it's a space where you can, again, post something. If you have a question about a tech issue that you just haven't resolved, you can post it in there. I will uh, tag people in that space. Uh, we also have uh, unique events in there, members only events as well. Uh, you can add 10 colleagues or nine colleagues for a total of 10 staff in the community space. So we're, we're really trying to encourage engagement. Okay, next slide. And then here, I just wanted to showcase what the community space looks like. Uh, if you open it up uh, to the right, you'll see um, our upcoming events. Um, we have biweekly office hours in here, but we also have unique members, member only events as well, based off of the feedback in terms of the topics we get from our members. Uh, also, of course, to the right, we have uh, the trending posts. So you can kind of see what people are talking about. Uh, to the left is kind of the main area where we house all our content and you can kind of get an understanding of how to get started as well. We have um, our members here. You can uh, find out who's who. Uh, you can post a, a question in the advice section. Uh, we have communities of purpose. We did start out with food and uh, food and security, uh, but by no means are they the only type of organization in here. We have about 190 to 200 organizations in here right now. Um, mental health organizations, youth service organizations, faith-based orgs, community service orgs, food insecurity orgs. So it runs the gamut and they all at least share something in common around technology, how to use it, how to get uh, adopt it for staff, for volunteers, how to feel confident uh, using it as well. So there's a lot you can gain, uh, in, again, from the shared experience and historical um, experience from your colleagues. Um, we also have communities of practice. So we started with Microsoft Cloud, and it's great. Uh, we have a lot of really, really useful uh, articles and posts in there. A lot of unique things that you might not uh, have known as well of how you can utilize uh, Microsoft 365. We just posted a new community, uh, communities of practice topic, which is emerging tech. That's really good. We've already posted a lot of good things around AI in there. Really useful too. And then, of course, to the left down here, you can see our upcoming events and our archived events as well. Then in the middle, we have our conversations. Um, this was one of the most recent posts in our emerging tech uh, section, again, getting started with uh, chat GPT, uh, part one. Okay, next slide. And then here, I just wanted to show um, the article section uh, in the community space. Um, my colleagues are great. These are really in-depth art, you know, articles and posts around uh, standard topics uh, that nonprofits and standard issues that nonprofits are dealing with as well. Okay, you can next slide. And then I just wanted to show some examples really quickly. Uh, to the left, we have um, examples of my colleagues uh, posting weekly in the space, a lot of, again, important topics around things like Microsoft 365, uh, website engagement with Wix. And then of course, uh, to the right, I just posted an example of some of the uh, posts from um, the members in the space around the things that they're asking about and they wanna get advice on. So if you see, it sort of really runs the gamut, electronic vouchers, uh, micro grants, antivirus software, website best practices. So the space is a really good area where you can, you know, if you have a lingering tech issue that you just haven't found resolution on, you can come here, you can post it. Or again, we have biweekly office hours. So you could, you know, uh, sign up an RSVP for them and, you know, get your questions answered with my colleague, Kevin Mulhall. Um, so that's that's great. And again, additionally, we have these unique members only events and the events really are tailored around the topics that we see in the space. So really trying to be strategic around um, what's important to the community. Okay, next slide. And then so yeah, so we have the community space again with um, members only content, a peer engagement, um, bi weekly office hours, uh, special events. And then we also have products. And I just show this slide to showcase uh, the value you can get through Quad. Again, it's a $200 membership for the year. Uh, these uh, four products are all donated products with an admin fee total of $307. That would be removed with a Quad membership. 
So I just want to kind of showcase the impact uh, and value of what you can get uh, through the year. If you have like a deep, a good and big ambitious tech plan, you can really, you know, gain a lot through this membership. Okay, next slide. Then here are some of our courses. Um, we have, you know, it says 170, but I think we, now we have maybe 200. Uh, but a lot of really useful um, courses, Excel 101, 201, and 301, that's really popular. Um, you know, uh, grant writing and management course, that's a high value and very popular course as well. A lot of courses that meet the needs or uh, that are intended to meet the needs of raising the skill set of your staff as well. And we have new ones around AI as well as uh, Adobe products too. So we're continually trying to understand um, what topics are important to nonprofits and how we could, you know, create courses that meet those needs too. Okay, next slide. Then we also have services. We partner with three different organizations, uh, known entities in the sector that work with nonprofits to provide services as well. Um, Help Desk is a great one shot. It's a call from one of our uh, tech partners. So again, you have a lot of ways to um, get support through Quad. You've got the office hours in the community space. Uh, you have your peers that can answer questions in the space. Then you have help desk services as well. So again, a lot of ways to um, uh, get some answers uh, from some lingering tech issues that you may have. Okay, next slide. Great, and as we're wrapping this up, if you have any questions for Aaron regarding Quad, please put them in the chat. So yeah, that's it. Again, just a quick recap, um, products, courses, and services with admin fees removed, uh, member support through me, we would do an assessment. I get an understanding of what you want to get out of the course of the year. I would help support you in um, all the ways that you need supporting around placing requests, understanding products. Um, and again, tagging you in the community space if it's a relevant conversation, a relevant topic that I think you'd be interested in. Uh, and then, of course, yeah, so that's all three community space uh, products, courses and services and member support. Um, what I will do is I will put the link to quad in the chat and you can actually just go online and search in the search field at techsoup.org for quad as well. But again, I'll put that in the in the oh, it looks like maybe Andrew already did that. So thanks, Andrew. But yeah, any questions, you can always email us and uh, we'll be happy to answer them. And that is all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron. And we did have one okay. quick question in the chat. Uh, Cal asks, are there memberships for individuals? There are not. Currently, um, we work with 501c3 nonprofits, and we have an emerging space for fiscally sponsored orgs as well. Uh, but it's not specifically for um, uh, individuals per se. Uh, but, so, you know, you can email me. There are some I guess exceptions, but those exceptions typically are around people that helped uh, build it out for us. Uh, but still, you know, I'd love to talk to you anyways about what the possibilities are. So you can email me and we, maybe we can have a conversation as well. Great. Thank you so much, Aaron. You're welcome. And yes, if anyone ever has any questions about uh, Quad, feel free to email us at community at techsoup.org. So one more reminder that we will be sharing the replay from today, today's event, including the slides, any links mentioned within a couple days. So now let's jump into the SEO content. Um, now for our, our presenter, Julian Grace. He's a digital solutions manager at TAP Network. With over eight years of experience in digital marketing, Julian is an expert in developing and ex executing data-driven marketing strategies that increase his client's efficiency and effectiveness. He is skilled in various digital marketing disciplines, including search engine optimization, SEO, web development and integration, social media marketing, and email automation. Julian is passionate about using digital marketing to make a positive impact in the nonprofit sector, and he has worked with dozens of nonprofits to help them achieve their fundraising and engagement goals. And with that, I will let you take it away, Julian. Thank you very much, happy to be here. So today we're gonna to be talking about SEO, search engine optimization. And as you can see by this outline here, um, hopefully by the end of this, I hope to have you very comfortable in understanding not just what's out there, but what's going, what you're going to need to do specific to your organization to you know, get the most benefit from SEO itself. So we're gonna start a little bit about what SEO is, get into um, goals and how to figure out what you'd exactly like, 
some of the technical parts of SEO, um, then actually executing on that plan, the social aspect, which is the, the backlinks, and then figuring out, okay, after we did all that, how do we determine the effect of it? So that's the, the high level overview of what we're going to uh, talk about today. So in uh, jumping right into it, the, uh, the first step here is we're gonna understand the purpose of search engine optimization. And so um, for the most part, when we talk about SEO, we are talking about Google and how sites are indexed by Google, how that works and, and, and what you appear for. Um, and search engine optimization is also not necessarily a task, but a result. A lot of things go into it. Uh, you have UX, content writing, um, you have uh, the technical side of things, and all of it contributes to an optimized state of your search engine performance. There are a lot of benefits to this. So increased online visibility is a really big one. Um, for the most part, you know, people who are on your email lists, who are following you in social media, stuff like that, they already know who you are. Uh, by really focusing on SEO, you can get new people, people who are searching for maybe general terms, um, you know, just looking for information, people who aren't, aren't aware of you yet. Uh, SEO is a great way to sort of get new people in your sphere of influence. It's also free to do. The only thing to, that you really need to focus on, you know, or, or really spend when you're dealing with SEO is your time. And hopefully by the end of, of this presentation, you're able to understand, you know, how to best spend that time. Uh, targeted traffic. So when we talk about targeted traffic, you're not just, you know, uh, blasting out and hoping to get, you know, uh, hit any person on the other side. You're really trying to get people who are searching for specific information have specific problems or, or are going to be otherwise relevant to the organization. And the final thing, by just optimizing for SEO, you tend to have more authoritative content out there, which shows you as a leader in, in, in whatever uh, sphere you're operating in. So there's a lot of reasons to pay attention to SEO, um, and, and there's also quite a lot of, of, of benefits out of it as well. So as we move on to step two, we're going to try and, and focus on how to set these specific goals for your, for your website. So the first thing is to really understand who you're trying to reach. Um, uh, what keywords and phrases are they likely to use when searching for information related to your nonprofit's mission? I have a client, they, they help uh, individuals in Washington State deal with the health system if they have you know, kids with behavioral health issues. And so they would often try and optimize for things like behavioral health, health systems navigation, things like this. But the people they were trying to reach and people they were trying to help were searching for things like how to help my child who's running away, um, what to do with a child with anger issues, how to fill out form X, Y, Z. Um, by understanding who exactly you're trying to reach, that will help you focus on exactly what you need to do um, in SEO. Next, you want to figure out, okay, what are these KPIs? Um, some of them, you know, standard are going to be things like website traffic, engagement, if you have conversion set up either in a form or a registration or something like that. Really spend some time to determine what's going to be the most important for your specific nonprofit, and then set specific goals for each one of those. You're not going to want to, you know, have really unreasonable ones. Uh, we're a big fan of SMART goals here at TAPS, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. That's a great way, especially when dealing with SEO, a great format to, to uh, put these KPIs in. Next thing, before you even go ahead and say, okay, now I'm going to do some SEO tasks, you're really going to need to understand where you are right now. So do an audit of the website. See, uh, you know, what you're showing up for now, who some of your search competitors are. Um, are there any gaps, even in the, in the user flow on the site? Really figure out your baseline so you'll have something to measure against as you're making all these changes and optimizations. Um, those measurable goals, really, you know, think smart and make sure that you're doing things that you're going to be able to get feedback on and results from so you can iterate moving forward. You're always going to want to get, you know, information for the next time you do something. Finally, develop an action plan. Uh, with digital marketing in general and specifically SEO, it's really easy to tread water. You can be expending a lot of energy and not really get anywhere. So if you have an action plan, you understand where you are and where you want to go, you'll be able to split that up into manageable chunks and really get a lot accomplished in an efficient manner. So when we're talking about SEO, a lot of the times the main thing we're talking about is keywords. So search engines really, uh, uh, they scan your entire site for live text. A common example may be that you, you have images for maybe an event or a, a fundraising drive you're trying to do, and you, know, you work with a designer, they're looking really nice, um, but they're, they're baked in as an image. Search engines can't see that, so you don't get the benefit of having that as a keyword on your site. Search engines really focus on, on live text, and we'll get into a couple different areas where you can put that live text to have an impact, 
Um, but inside that text, you're going to want to have keywords. You're going to want to use the words and phrases that you're hoping people search for and have you show up for in your website content. And there's a couple of different types of keywords. So you have head keywords, body keywords, and long tail keywords. You want to have a good mix of all of these uh, you know, on each one of your website pages. Head keywords are going to be those things that you think are going to uh, you know, be the most applicable. You know, they're going to be a little bit shorter, and there's going to be a lot of people searching for them. As you get further down, you know, things, uh, you may have some stuff called uh, body keywords in there that may be more specific to the things you do. Maybe it's technical jargon specific to the communities you help, or even just uh, ways you like to phrase things. You know, maybe you, you like to use formerly incarcerated rather than prisoners or something like that. Um, being able to, to use that language specific to what you want to target. And finally, long tail keywords. Those are really good for things like, like questions. And maybe you have an FAQ or, or a resources page where people can download materials. Having those helps you show up uh, if, if there's common questions that your organization solves. So when you're trying to think of keywords, really look at, okay, what are we trying to accomplish? Who are we trying to get in here? Figure out a bunch of keywords, you know, make a list in Excel or a Word document and plan out all the things you'd like to uh, show up for. Then maybe do a little research. There are, are plenty of SEO tools that will help you understand what your competitors are using. And competitors doesn't necessarily need to be a negative thing. It could just be people fighting for uh, uh, the same keywords in search, but you may be in completely different areas of the country, different spheres of influence. Finally, take all that information, refine it down, remove the extraneous ones that you don't think are going to easily integrate into your content, and develop your action plan from there. And so once you have those keyword, uh, that list of keywords, uh, we're going to get into the technical side of things. So there's a couple things uh, with SEO you want to be careful with. Uh, Stephen, if you could bump to the next slide for me, please. Thank you. So uh, one thing I always like to point out, a lot of people use WordPress for their sites. There is a little tiny checkbox in your settings that says discourage this page from being indexed by search engines. You know, if you're having some trouble showing up for SEO things, it could be something as simple as that. You know, other website platforms are going to have a similar thing. It's going to, you know, depend on the specific platform where you find that, but make sure it's indexable. So really uh, take some time to familiarize yourself with the SEO fundamentals and key concepts so you can understand, okay, we know what keywords are. Um, we're going to start to, you know, maybe look at some of those metrics in Google Search Console, something like that. Learn about the technical elements. So figuring out how to exactly lay out your sites, you know, optimizing it, you know, maybe uh, paying attention to the size of the images you're uploading. So Google's not saying, hey, uh, we're not going to show this, this website as high because it takes so long to load. People aren't finding what they need. Um, it's, it's always good, like I mentioned, not just for a content audit, but a technical audit. Make sure that you have things like your robots.txt file, instructions for website crawlers. If you have anything that you, you know, don't want to be indexed, you can have specific rules in there, really allow you to customize what you're going to appear for um, in, in Google search and other search engines. And finally, figure out you know, any of those, those uh, key problems you find in the audit and get them set up and, and fixed before you jump to the actual content development. Being able to give yourself a strong base to build off of, I think is going to uh, really help the effectiveness of any sort of advanced uh, content writing and, and site layout stuff you're going to do. So pay attention to all of the, um, uh, the technical aspects. It's gonna vary depending on you know, which platform you use for your website, um, but this should be a fairly one-time thing. And then just keep an eye on things like your image uploads. You know, if there's anything that you know, uh, causes your site to load a little more slowly, removing them. But once you're set up, you should be good uh, uh, for a while. Now, there's a couple places that we can put keywords. One thing we don't want to do is just say, hey, we want to show up for this keyword. Let me type this 60 times at the, at the footer of each page. Google's going to ping you for that. It's not going to work. So while you are optimizing for a search engine, that search engine is trying to determine what's going to be the best for a user on the other end. So you always want to make sure that what you're doing is going to be helpful for people actually using your site. A site is a tool for users and for yourself that allows them to, to complete an action, learn more about something, get more involved with your organization. So make sure anything you're doing SEO-wise ultimately serves that goal. So some of the places we can put things are, are page titles. And you can see in the, uh, the second image towards the bottom, that purple text is the, is the meta page title. So when you see, see things like meta titles, meta descriptions, things like that, your page title, that's, that's what we're talking about there, that purple text. The meta description is that text underneath. So meta descriptions don't have 
um, a one-to-one uh, -one effect on your SEO. Uh, page titles do, so you want to have keywords in your page titles, but meta descriptions are really for the users. I know a lot of website platforms are going to sort of automatically generate some of them based on you know, the text that they see on the, on the website, but really take control of that. It's a really good opportunity to give people who are searching for maybe general terms a reason to click. You're prompting them with additional information so that they know that, hey, I'm clicking on this, I'm going to get this information, learn about this, this seems relevant to me. Spend some time using keywords in that, not because they have a direct effect on your ranking, but because they're going to help the people who are actually searching for those terms. Header tags are another big thing to pay attention to. Um, I know a lot of folks, you know, maybe if you're using a template, you like to use header tags as design elements. Oh, I want text to look this way. Let me use an H3 tag. Oh, this text looks really nice. Let me use an H1 tag. Really think about using header tags instead of structural elements and styling things a little bit separately. So you want each page to have an H1 heading, and that H1 heading should have a keyword in it, maybe a head keyword, something short that's not going to be like, oh, they obviously just stuff a keyword in there. Um, but, you know, structure them out so you have a hierarchy of, okay, here's the overall content of the page. That's your heading for your H1. Maybe you have two subsections that you talk about, you know, uh, two different approaches. Those are H2s. As you go further down, structure your content with those, those header tags. Body content's the big one. This is where you're going to have the most opportunity to really, one, write content, give people the information they want. But two, you're going to have opportunities to place keywords within your website. So once you have a, a good amount of body content uh, developed, you'll be able to say, okay, well, maybe we'll turn this into a call to action. And that will prompt people to you know, go to a different portion on their website if this isn't quite what they wanted. Uh, you have the ability to do some of those like, question and answers, just more opportunity to put in keywords in helpful and useful ways. And finally, we have image alt text. So that's something that will happen, you know, if you hover over an image, it'll come up with the alt text or say an image doesn't load for some reason, the alt text will show in its, its space. It's also really good for website accessibility for people that use screen readers, they can get an idea of what the image is all about. So include the target keywords and the alt text of the images. Uh, it really helps search engines understand what your image is about. I know a lot of nonprofits tend to use stock photography that you know maybe highlights the words and their mission. Uh, you can still you know use helpful alt text to sort of make that stock photography work for you as well. It's especially helpful though if you're developing you know maybe uh, custom graphics that you want people to find in, in Google search results or anything like that. Pay a little bit of attention to your image alt text. I find it's really helpful to do that when you're uploading the image. Um, you know sometimes if you haven't done this before, it is a little bit of work to go through your entire image library and set them. It's well worth it though. And then moving forward, you know, you can upload the optimized images and add the alt text right there. Um, it, it should keep you right on track. Now, when we're talking about backlinks, this is the social aspect of SEO. So one of the ways that search engines determine, you know, who's going to show up above who and things like this is the page authority and site authority. And one of the ways that they determine, you know, the, the authoritativeness of a given page or a site is how many times it's referenced somewhere else on the internet. So that's what a bank backlink is. It's saying, okay, on a completely different domain, somebody is linked to this website. They've said, hey, this is, is, is uh, uh, worthy content, it's helpful, informational, um, you know, let, informative. Let's, let's really take this and you know, bump this up in the, in the uh, search results a bit. So there's a couple of different ways that you can approach this. One of them is donor and partner websites. You know, especially if we're talking quad and creating this community of nonprofits, finding like-minded organizations that, you know, uh, either, either do the same thing or work really well together. See if you can just link to each other on maybe a resources page or a partner's page, something like that. Another way is media coverage. Um, new sites, you know, they'll, they'll put out press releases, maybe even do, um, you know, some more uh, robust coverage. That would be a, a great way to get, you know, a little more page authority because those new sites are putting out a lot of contents, a whole bunch, so they have very high uh, uh, site authority scores. And you can sort of say, well, I, I'm linked to by a very authoritative site. That's going to then you know, have a positive effect on yourself as well. Social media profiles is a great one, not just for SEO, but when we're thinking about digital marketing, somebody's first touch, you want, to want them to have all the information possible. So you know, if they find you for the first time on Facebook, you don't want them to have to go to Google to search for your name. They should be able to go to your profile, click on your link, and have all the information you know, right there available to them. That really carries across any social media profile as well. Online directories are really good. Um, you know, some nonprofits are, are able to be listed on, on neighborhood websites or maybe even community boards, things like that. 
And then guest blogging. This is a really good one if you're an organization that provides a lot of information or maybe does impact reports, research, things like that. Write a guest blog post for a different website that's relevant to your nonprofit's mission. Don't necessarily want to do something like that just for the sake of doing it, but if you can find a organization or a website that really uh, meshes well with what you do and what you're trying to do, see if you can write a guest blog post, include some links in that post, and there you'll be able to optimize for those keywords, get a little more uh, uh, page authority, and also get those backlinks. In. So now, once we've done all that, we know, okay, where we are now, we know what we want to do, you know, the keywords that we're, we're going to try and implement, and we have a, a, a pretty good idea of, of all the places that we can input those keywords. So once you've done all that, how are you really going to understand, you know, exactly the effect this has had? A really big one is Google Analytics. So um, July 1st is the big date for the Google Analytics 4 switch. Make sure you're converted over before then. And in Google Analytics 4, they, they offer a uh, a lot more things that used to be sort of uh, wrapped up in Tag Manager or something like that, it's a lot more powerful than uh, plain old universal analytics. From there, you'll be able to see where people came from, you know, the search term they use to get to your page, and also how they're using the site after that. So if people, if you did, uh, do really well for a, a keyword in your ranking on there, um, you want to be able to see, okay, well, once people click on this page, what do they do after that? Are they going to different areas? Are they leaving right away? Are they filling out forms or downloading files? Uh, Google Analytics is a great tool to understand that. Search Console is another Google product. That's basically how you interface with the Google uh, uh, crawler. You can upload your sitemap or even a link to your sitemap, so it's always updated. You can check to see how well your website was indexed. If there's uh, any other sort of like errors that you might have, Search Console will be able to tell you, hey, this is the last time you called the page. This was the issue with it. Here's what you need to do to fix it. So it's really worth uh, going in there you know, every couple of weeks, every couple of months, just to make sure there's no issues. Or if you're trying to troubleshoot a specific thing, like, hey, where are we ranking for X, Y, Z? You'll be able to do that in Google Search Console. Speaking of ranking things, something like SEM Rush is really good for keyword ranking tools to understand historically how you've performed for a certain keyword. So it's not like there are, um, you know, people, uh, you know, the, the website exists and then you come in and you're there's a clear path to the top. Lots of organizations are doing SEO, and you're always going to be sort of needing to update your content and really have a good plan for, for how to, to uh, deal with changes in, in the content and in different rankings. So by using a keyword ranking tool, you'll be able to see, okay, well, we added these uh, you know, keywords to this page. Let's wait a week and see how this has impacted our rankings. Um, understanding that will help you sort of stop spinning your tires if you're doing a lot and you know not seeing results. This will sort of be able to tell you, give you a little bit of, of uh, data backing to understand the results of your actions. Then finally, backlink analysis tools. Um, going on every website in the world and searching for your name is not going to be the most time effective option. I wouldn't recommend it. So use something, again, SEM Rush is a great option. There's plenty of them out there, but just understand, hey, where else is this website being ranked? And it'll help you possibly even uncover new opportunities to say, hey, I think this would really fit. Let's see if we can get a link on this website. And so I know uh, I just threw a lot of information at you. Um, uh, I tried to keep everything very you know, uh, general. So depending on uh, what website platform you're using or anything like that, you'll be able to get the value of this. Um, we have the rest of the time available for Q&A. And so if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer, and I know we're probably going to get some really good ones that are going to be valuable for everybody, so please don't hesitate to, uh, to ask any questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Julian. That was really great, very informative, and I, I feel like I learned a lot about SEO just now. Wonderful. Um, so thank you. Um, we do have a few questions submitted, and yes, if you have any questions, please be sure to go into the Q&A tab right now and submit them so we can address them. Um, one question, what tools would you recommend to find SEO keywords? Sure, so there's a couple out there. Um, something like Moz may be a really good sort of just free uh, thing to take a look at. Uh, here at the agency, we're a big fan of SEM Rush. It's a very powerful tool and it'll allow you to do a lot of research. So um, there's a couple other aspects to it though, just beyond finding keywords that are available. Uh, sometimes you might wanna poll uh, community members, maybe people on your Facebook page, understand what they search for when they're trying to find information relevant to you. Um, you might also even want to do something like if you're running Google Ads, uh, just like to point out that nonprofits get a, a really good deal on some Google ad credits through Google for nonprofits. 
Um, but really see, okay, what are people searching for that you're showing up for? What are their search terms in Google Ads that you can then turn into your SEO keywords? So if you're running a lot of, of Google Ads, you'll be able to see, hey, we're showing up when people search these words. Instead of just having this be just in Google Ads, why don't we try and incorporate this into our content so we start ranking for that as well? So there's a couple of different ways. You know, you can always look at those technical tools like Mosin and SEMrush. Look into the Google Ads and see what you're showing up for uh, in your paid search. And then just ask around. So you always want to make sure that you're, you're optimizing for the people you want to help and the people who help you help those people. So make sure that you're, you're getting their input as well. So they may be using completely different terms than you think. It's really good to just get some grounding in, in, in real human interactions as well. Thank you, Julie. And one other question, or we have a few more questions. The next one, how often should you do a website audit? So this one is really going to depend on what you're auditing. Things like SEO audits are good, you know, eight months to a year. Uh, you know, you can do it a little more frequently if you're making a lot of changes. But, you know, taking a look at your, at your at SEO on that level, you know, you're not going to want to do that too often because you want to spend most of your time making changes and fixing them. And then you'll be able to analyze the results on a little bit of a longer term. If you're looking at things like content, I find that's really good to do, you know, on a six-month basis. Um, you know, organizations aren't static. Things are changing all the time. Program offerings are different. People come and go. Really take a look at, at the, the text on your website and understand, is this still relevant? Has this changed at all? Are there any opportunities there? And then finally, for a sort of technical side audit, um, try and just check in on things. If you have a site like WordPress that uses plugins, try and check in on that every week or every other week. Really make a plan to make sure um, uh, that's staying up to date. So that way that doesn't turn into a bigger problem down the road be able to get things as they update. You know, if there's a you know, big version update, you'll be able to tackle that and you'll be prepared for it. So depending on what you're auditing, there's a little bit of a time frame, but I, I hope that's a, a helpful answer. Great, thank you, Julian. Um, I know you've already mentioned some great tools, um, but are there any other free tools you recommend that would be helpful with SEO? So I think part of, part of that goes into uh, the SEO is actually the results. So depending on what you're trying to do uh, as an SEO task, there's a couple of different ones. You know, if you just want to understand um, how your site is being optimized on a, a very quick level, look at Google Search Console. That's going to be your direct interface uh, with the Google Search Engine crawler. If you're looking for, you know, maybe some uh, 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 design and UX layouts using something like Web AIM. AIM that's going to give you like a, a uh, accessibility overview if your color contrast is off, if you know text is too small, things that the uh, search algorithm might penalize you for. That's going to give you a, a great high level overview of things like that. And then finally, like I mentioned, some of those other keyword, uh, keyword tools are going to give you uh, the benefit of finding new stuff. Um, and then once you're trying to actually incorporate that, uh, use a writing tool. So you don't necessarily need to do all of your writing in the website platform itself. You can take that off, use something like Grammarly, uh, I know uh, the, the big thing is AI right now. So there's a lot of tools out there that'll help you write things. Don't let AI write all of your content for you, but you can use it as a, a, a helpful tool to you know, get you started, refine things, make things a little more readable. Great, we're getting a, some other great questions in. Um, what free keyword ranking and backlink ranking, ranking platforms do you recommend? So with that, um, a lot of that stuff is going to be behind a pay, uh, paywall. The big players are, uh, are Moz and SEMrush. They're going to give you, I think, the most helpful information. Um, depending on, on exactly what you're trying to rank, they may have some free uh, uh, web pages where you can just do some basic. It might give you like your top 10 keywords, things like that, just to get you started. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of uh, uh, either accurate or helpful uh, uh, free options for that. So that tends to be the thing that um, you know, they, they put behind uh, the paywall because everything else can be indexed in other tools. Um, you can do your Google search console stuff, all that for free. So the, the way these platforms are really making their money is based around, uh, you know, providing access to that sort of information. Got it. Thank you. Um, Steve says, the last time I looked at Google Analytics, it was only available for large organizations and big websites. Is that still the case? Nope. Everybody's available to do it for free. You know, from an individual to a corporation, uh, you're able to just sign up at Google Analytics. You're gonna wanna, even though uh, July 1st is coming soon, you're still able to create the old property. Don't know why they let you do that, but make sure you're on Google Analytics 4. 
Um, it's going to give you a lot of helpful information there, and it's uh, completely free and, and open to everybody. Cool. Um, <clears throat> a few more questions. Mm -hmm. How can you influence frequently asked questions on Google search results with SEO? So that one is a little bit uh, complicated. So there are things uh, in, uh, you can basically optimize a, a uh, website page, with some additional information. So you might see if you're running a Google ad, you can add things like site links and call outs and additional information. That's called structured data. So that's basically taking information on your site and putting it in the structured data format to then make it available for things like, you know, the frequently asked questions or it'll pop up in like a little knowledge box. Google controls that. Um, while they do make some portions of their algorithm available to us, and we know some of it uh, from tools that are like doing research and trying to basically uh, uh, build the Google al algorithm backwards, um, there's not like a, you do this, you show up in the FAQs there. It's gonna be all determined on Google's end. So the best you can do is have that helpful information there. Um, if you're running a Google ad, you'll be able to specify some stuff in those site links and call outs. Um, but really structured data is going to make you available for those things, but you won't be able to directly influence that. Great. Um, this might be a big question, but George asks, how do I go about changing my Google Analytics? So in the bottom left-hand corner, that's your admin section. And uh, for any given account, you're going to have a properties option. And in there, you're going to see something called the GA4 setup assistant, or just setup assistant. That's going to be the easiest way to transfer if you have universal uh, analytics thing set up, whether you have custom stuff in there or not, it's going to walk you through creating it. Um, uh, you'll be able to put in your domain name and the big change in Google Analytics is that instead of just putting in you know, a piece of code, all the data is brought into a property through something called a data stream. So it's going to walk you through creating a web data stream and show you how to put it on your site. Either you copy and paste a little strip of code or depending on uh, you know, the website platform you have, it may have a first party integration. I know uh, for WordPress sites, we really like using Google Site Kit, um, but there's also you know, plenty of other ones out there. And that's gonna give you the basic configuration. The big note I would say is if you're setting up Google Analytics 4, make sure in the data stream, you're gonna have an option called enhanced measurements. That's gonna give you data beyond just page views. It's gonna give you things like, hey, when did somebody scroll to the bottom of 90% of the page? When did somebody start or submit a form? Or when did they uh, uh, download a file, play a video, things like that? So make sure you turn on enhanced measurement for you know, the mo most robust information out there. Um, but that setup assistant is gonna be the easiest way to bring things over. It's gonna help you if you have custom conversions and stuff set up in universal analytics, it'll allow you to bring them over to the, uh, to the new platform as well. Uh, you'll still have all of your old data available in the uh, universal analytics property. But because Google Analytics 4 looks at data in such a different way, it used to be there's page views and events. Now everything's an event. So a page view is an event. So it's just you won't be able to have data in the same place, but all of your old data will still exist. And just make sure to do that before July 1st. Great. Thank you, Julian. Um, just a reminder, if you have not had your question answered yet, please uh, be sure to submit them in the Q&A tab as we're answering them right now. Jennifer asks, is there a website audit tool, to-do list, or sample you can provide to us? I can definitely see if there's something we can send along. You know, uh, one of the things I do here at Tap Network is I do a lot of technical and SEO audits. That tends to involve a lot of stuff, though. So depending on what exactly you're trying to do, uh, uh, like I said before, there's going to be different tools available to you. But really, I think if you break it down from a, we want to understand the technical configuration. OK, we're going to make sure we have all of our meta information up there. You know, we're not uh, blocking ourselves from being indexed. Um, you know, we have all the, the appropriate files up there. That's one side of it. Then you might want to do a content audit to understand, okay, what exactly are we ranking for? What are we saying? How are we saying it? So you can look at different things for um, uh, basically setting up a checklist for yourself. Like on this page, are we mentioning, you know, the things you want to be mentioning? If not, you know, how can we integrate them? Um, so really depending on what you want to do, it's going to vary, but I can definitely see if we can send something along. Great. And yes, if we um, have any resources, we'll be sure to share those in our post-event email, along with the replay and the slides. If you have any other questions, please be sure to submit them into the Q&A tab. We do have some other questions. How can organizations create a keyword strategy that is unique from 
are competitors that likely use the same keywords? Yep. So the first step of that is going to be to understand what your competitors actually use. So doing something like a, a competitor audit, for example, to go off that last question, really trying to, to run some of those uh, keyword tools on competitor websites, it's going to give you an idea of what they're ranking for. It may be different from what they're trying to rank for, and you know, hopefully you're going to do a better job at SEO, uh, but really just make a list of, of what they're doing and then see how, that, how well that matches up with what you actually want to do and what you want to rank for any gaps that exist there. So sometimes you may be able to rank for a keyword that's more specific to your organization, and you know, maybe a different phrasing or a, a, uh, a different approach to the same information. So when you're really trying to uh, deal with competitors, a lot of it's just going to be looking at um, uh, what's tagged as a keyword by any of these tools or by Google Search Console, or even if you're trying to look at, like I mentioned, some of those search terms in Google Ads, which is a little bit different from the keywords. Um, but really just taking a look at that and then just having two lists and comparing them, seeing, you know, the density of one, hey, they use this word quite a lot, or there's uh, there's a score on some of these tools called keyword difficulty, which is basically on a scale of zero to one, how difficult or how much work it's going to take to rank for that keyword. So see, okay, maybe there's some really difficult keywords you want to spend a lot of time trying to rank for, but then, you know, maybe we'll have maybe 60% of our other keyword strategy keywords uh, really focusing on, you know, lower ones, things that are more available, gaps in the search market, things like that. Great. Thank you, Julian. Another question. Um, I know you mentioned a few different types of keywords to use on the website, mm -hmm. um, but is there any idea of if phrases or individual keywords usually work better for SEO? So what that's going to come down to primarily is what kind of information you're, you're looking to rank for. So it's really going to depend on, okay, some, uh, some organizations are going to really be really focused on things like Q and A's or providing solutions to, you know, common questions. In that example of, you know, navigating the health system, you're going to want to have longer keywords uh, rather than general ones. Um, other ones, you know, you may be providing very similar services to, you know, maybe even for-profit uh, options out there. So in that case, you're going to want to really focus on those general keywords that have a higher search volume. And then you can add sort of, um, I guess, additions onto those keywords that, you know, maybe make it more specific to your organization. Uh, you can do things like a, a nonprofit XYZ, something like that. So uh, something maybe you may intend to write something as a, uh, you know, a long tail keyword, but it's being indexed by Google as a single one. That's still good. You know, maybe we'll be able to figure that out. Like, hey, we're really ranking for this one word in the middle of the long tail keyword uh, that we implemented in our strategy, you know, three months ago, you'll be able to see that, you know, in your, uh, in your analytics and stuff like that. So that will help give you insight into what is actually happening. But, you know, try and write the most helpful, informative information you can really focus on the user on the other end of, of the computer. And from there, apply all of your SEO knowledge from that point. So don't just say, hey, uh, you know, hamburgers are ranking really well in Google. Let me, you know, try and include hamburger in here. That's not going to be relevant or helpful to the people you're trying to uh, to reach and interact with. So focus on, on that. And then within that frame of reference, apply all the knowledge you have from SEO here. Great. Thank you, Julian, so much. Um, if you have any other questions, be sure to quickly put them in the chat. Otherwise, we will move on. Great. And if you ever do have any questions, um, be sure to submit them in the TechSoup community forums, and we'll make sure one of our SEO experts can address them there. And we'll make sure that link is sent in the post-event email as well. So before we close out, we'd love to hear from you. What's one thing you learned today about SEO? I do see uh, Jane left a comment oh, here yes. while people are putting things in. I've heard that Google for nonprofits have become stricter for the 10, and I, I believe she, she means the $10,000 a month in credits. Um, they have become stricter in, in some ways, but they've also opened up quite a bit uh, in the past. So you used to not be able to do single word keywords. You used to have to do phrases. They removed that. They also opened up um, you know, uh, display ads as well. So one of the things that they, they are a little more strict about sometimes is nonprofits tend to deal with a lot of uh, community issues and try and really solve problems. 
sometimes the, the phrasing of those problems is deemed as you know inappropriate uh, for, for some advertisers. So if you're a nonprofit that's trying to help with you know maybe uh, drug abuse rehabilitation or, or you know maybe domestic violence or something like that or even things about uh, you know first time home buyers if you're an organization that does something like that, Google is going to give a lot more sort of uh, uh, attention to, to your account and you may have to do some you know manual appeals and stuff like that. So while, while there are you know, some things that they are stricter about, it's not gonna be you know, broadly applicable to everybody, but if you are one of those organizations, I would say really just be conscientious of the way you're phrasing things. Um, you know, leave a lot of the, if you're getting hit for like a repeated uh, offensive to Google, not generally, uh, keyword, you know, maybe include that on the uh, website page, but find a different way to talk about that uh, for the advertising. So you can make the most out of the $10,000 a month. One of the things that we see nonprofits run into quite a bit is that uh, you're working in such niche communities or, or niche problem areas that the search volume of the terms you're trying to reach, you know, precludes you from using that full $10,000 a month. You might be only using, you know, $700 a month just because, hey, 30 people a month are searching for this. You know, that's still a worthy cause. You're going to help those 30 people and get them the information they need. But just sort of be aware there are a lot of caveats with that, that and it's very hard to reach the full $10,000 utilization each month especially for nonprofits that are doing, you know, very specific and helpful work. Great. Thank you, Julian. Rianne shares, guest blog posting is a great idea. Learning about new SEO tools or ones I haven't tried in a long time is very helpful. Thank you for sharing, Rianne. Um, I guess we have one more question in the chat before we wrap up. T says, I learned about Good Console and not quite sure what is going on with Google Analytics before July 1st. Can you explain? Sure. So for quite a while, the way that Google Analytics was working is that it had something called Universal Analytics. And it was a fairly standard that existed for quite a while. And then, you know, they, they've been developing Google Analytics 4 for a couple of years and still in development, but they're having the hard launch. So they're sunsetting Universal Analytics, meaning that the way they're capturing data you know, uh, you know, usage data, you know, scrolls, events, things like that in universal analytics, it's basically so different that, you know, they need to have a complete version update. So with that, something that's really important to know is that you need to install you know, the new tag and get that information in the proper format. The way they do that now is they just track events, a page view is an event, um, you know, like I mentioned, a file download, a click is an event, things like that. And so uh, just changing over the way that they intake data means that they need to really separate the old stuff from the new stuff. So July 1st is the date they provided where it's saying, hey, the old way, not going to get anything new. If you want any new data from July 1st onward, you need to be on the, on the new platform. Great. Thank you so much, Julian. And again, if anyone ever has any other questions, please feel free to post them in the text to community forums. We'll make sure one of our SEO experts can answer that for you. So thank you again, especially to the behind the scene producers and staff at TechSoup who made this event possible. Last thing before we say goodbye, please be sure to complete our post event survey. You'll find it in the chat and it'll also pop up automatically once you close Zoom. Again, we will be sharing the replay from today's event along with the slides and any links mentioned in the email within a few days. Thank you everyone for joining us. We hope to see you soon.